Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to Umlink Energy Speaks Back, powered by Hark. My name is Paul Webb. I'm the founder of B2B Energy, and I'm your host. Weekly, I present to you experts from around the world, and today I'm in Stockholm. Our purpose, as always, is to provide a good understanding of energy management knowledge from around the world which is available today for us to deliver savings that impact on our planet. So before I get into today's interview, I would like to recognize our sponsors. And they are Umlink, who are taking the confusion out of energy management, Clean Energy Revolution for their knowledge and their networking in the renewable world, B2B Energy for the 11 week energy program and focusing on organization's third largest expense, Hark Systems, renowned for their energy software, Lexus Energy for their power management, led by Vision, who are an LED and a controls company, SimeWatts for electronics and EV transition, Carbon Black Global for their waste to energy initiatives, Cinefex for their insulation coating, SmartCool for their AC initiatives, and lastly, our certificate partners, Esther Energy. Welcome to episode 74 of Unlink Energy Speaks Back, powered by Hark. And my special guest today is passionate, persistent, and professional. He is thrilled to speed the transition to an affordable, sustainable society at Ducky.eco. So without any further ado, I give you Jason Irwin. Good afternoon, Jason, and how are you today? Very good, Paul. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I'm saying good afternoon because you're in Sweden today, I'll take it. You got it. Exactly. Just a touch outside of Stockholm. Right. And we were about an hour's difference, but I believe you probably got more snow than we have. You, you, guessed, you guessed right. We've got a nice, healthy dusting of the white stuff on the ground. Um, and that was a fun thing for the, the family to, uh, to, to get into during the Christmas holidays here. Right. Well, the UK is currently very gray. It has been for the last two weeks. We've had some rain, but no, well, we've seen snow once, but it was very, very fine. Um, my girlfriend can't wait. She's never seen snow. We've seen some, seen some artificial <laughs> snow recently, but that didn't really count. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Well, so, if Omicron allows, uh, you could take a quick tour over to Scandinavia, Norway, or Sweden. You'll see some of the white stuff. I'd love to do that. Um, so, Jason, we've met through our common network um, of people regarding the energy um, network that we we work with. Um, so I've started to get to know you personally, but for the benefit of our audience today, can you tell us about yourself, um, what your background is and what you're doing within the industry? Yeah, absolutely, Paul. Well, so um, maybe your audience can hear from my accent that uh, I'm not an original Swedish uh, country person, but uh, I, do come, I do come from the U.S. originally um, and moved here as a student. Um, when I was doing my master's work. And so now, now I'm uh, comfortable in saying I'm both Swedish and American, and it's, it's a lot of fun to be uh, a dual citizen. Um, but yeah, how I got, I guess the story in a nutshell, um, in my story in a nutshell uh, is that, uh, you know, how I got into energy and, and in particular uh, energy efficiency and a focus on now on decarbonization um, which I'm doing as a consultant from here. Um, but I started out pretty early as a kid. I was inspired a lot by going out into the wetlands and marshes with my father, um, who's an ecologist, and studied how sea level rise was affecting the, the birds and the wildlife um, in the marshes of the eastern U.S. Um, and so I got to see firsthand as a kid um, you know, get experience around what some of the impacts of climate change could be. 
um, and you know really kind of got that environmental ethic uh, right away as a, as a child from my from my parents and um, and then you know I did I did studies around natural sciences um, and and uh, after school after college I I started working as a consultant in environmental the environmental area and with different regulations. Um, but I always kind of saw energy as this interesting nexus of where, um, where you could, by managing energy and by reducing your energy use and demand, whether you're households or companies or institutions, that it made such a, uh, was such a nexus of benefits in terms of, you know, environmental benefits, but also economic benefits and, and other types of benefits. So. Um, when I had the chance to to do some work on energy, I, I jumped at it and uh, started working in energy management for some some clients in the U.S. I was with Booz Allen Hamilton at that time, um, and then uh, really just that stuck. And um, I wanted to I, I sort of tested a few things, uh, a few branches of that from there, but I kept coming back um, to to energy efficiency, energy. Uh, energy space and policy work now. So I guess that's my, my short story. I'll, <laughs> I'll see We've got time that, to go on to the long version. <laughs> We've got time to go on to the long version too. For so what sure. are you doing now? What, where, where is that taking to you now? Why, why Sweden and, and what are you doing today? Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. So I, I just, I was one of those serendipitous things that I was working in Washington um, as, a, as a consultant, as I mentioned. And um, I just, through a friend of a friend, they told me about this program in Sweden that was focused on sustainability. Um, and, you know, I thought, well, that I'd always wanted to branch out and, and try Europe. We had an exchange student from Denmark when I was in high school. So Scandinavia was kind of this, uh, this attractive part of the world. And when I heard about this program at Lund University, this master's program, I really jumped on it. And fortunately, I, I got in there, um, and at the time, it was even it was a free program for international students. So I, I think that the Swedish government's changed the rules now, so they're not. Uh, it's not it's free, not a, but it's still for it's, international it's, students. It's not a free ride anymore, right? But uh, no, so I, I I went, I jumped at that. I was a year and a half program, um, but maybe as a familiar story to some, when you change countries that you, you might need a special person. So mm -hmm. that was my case. I met my, my now wife there at Lone University and we, so, so I stayed longer than my, my parents, um, and maybe my family back in the States would have wanted me to. Um, so I've been here now for, for almost 10 years and yeah. And, and during that time, I've really, uh, I'm still working as a consultant and I would say that we've been, Focusing on, on um, maybe how I mean both both sort of the policy level uh, of of interaction. How do you how do you inform and develop good policies at the government national level and the regional level and within the European Union Europe um, to promote energy management and energy efficiency? And how do you really inform that by building good evidence and good um, good stories? Um, good narratives to to help uh, build public support for efficiency and, and energy programs, but also uh, I'd say the focus in the last couple of years has been more about um, looking at it from a private investment decision making perspective and trying to investigate you know how are how are companies making decisions that impact their energy use and their energy profile. Um, and especially now with such a focus on climate change and uh, and carbon, you know how how do you how do we really accelerate investments, private investments in energy efficiency and um, and decarbonization? And that's been a focus that we've had. We're we're a small firm, you know, just five people really based in Stockholm, but we have a, a quite a large network across Europe and internationally that we work with of, of different partners. Um, and with those partners, we've been quite active in several innovation projects, you know, investigating new business models and 
tools and processes for how to help companies and, and particularly energy managers to um, get a hang handle on all of the value that you know energy efficiency and energy management can bring. And then also to be able to communicate and position that so that when the companies are ready to make their investment decisions that they have a very concrete, solid business case uh, for those measures or projects that they want to implement. So I think that's that's where you and I have talked before a little bit about maybe some of the, the new stuff that could be exciting for, for the uh, audience today. Yeah. One thing I want to pick up on, <clears throat> uh, you was in America and you were talking about energy efficiencies and energy management. And then all of a sudden you started to come into Sweden and then the energy management efficiencies, your vocabulary changed to sustainability. Yeah. Now, I always see Sweden and the Norway and all those areas are miles ahead of us in regarding technologies and what they've been doing for the environment. They've always been that edge. And I just felt that in that when you started yeah. saying that, the vocabulary changed, didn't it? Yeah, you're, it's a real astute observation. I, yeah, I, if I can, if I think about it, I think part of it was the time period um, in which I was working. So I, I started working in the 2000s, you know, the 90s, really late 90s and 2000s. Um, I mean, at that time, the sustainability was such a new was such a new field. It wasn't mm -hmm. really, it was very squishy, wasn't very well defined. I think in the U.S. in particular, um, there wasn't a big focus on it, uh, mm -hmm. and and I would say in in the the clients that we worked with and this, the the different states and the regions, you know, some of them were a little more progressive on it. Um, but, but a lot of it was, you know, you had to boil it down to dollars and cents terms. And, and it was very focused on sort of the economics um, and, the, and sort of that was the value. And um, yeah, you're right. When I, when I moved over to Sweden and started to study in sustainability, I, I think there was that geographical shift and the, there was a, just sort of a higher level of awareness and and vigor around sustainability um, based on whatever, based on the circumstances here, the ethics here, the politics here. Um, but then also, I think over the years, you've seen as you also, I mean, you've seen a huge momentum shift. I mean, and, and I can say, say now with all of the work happening in the, at the policy level in Europe with the, the new green taxonomy, sustainability taxonomy that sort of sustainability has taken a, a much more central position yeah yeah do you find um and i find this in with legislation and that it just doesn't have the i always say it hasn't got enough teeth or it hasn't got any teeth we we set out these things especially in the uk we we have um two particular areas, which is ESOS, which is the Energy Saving Opportunity Scheme, which is a, a scheme that's been put across the whole of Europe. But ESOS is how the UK has addressed it. And then we have SECRA, which is um, the Streamlined Energy Carbon Reporting. Each of those areas, legislations, it's all about doing energy assessments, putting reporting together and analysing your data. But that's it. Stops. You don't have to do anything after that. You, there's no legislation to say you must go and implement that. Now, I have heard and spoken to people in like across Europe that say their legislation is different. They have to do X amount of those measures that they've put together. And and do you, do you see that in in Sweden where you you have to go and do things as part of legislation? Yeah, I think that, that there's really active discussions around that. I think historically, you were right that if you were, say, a real estate property owner, building owner, industrial owner, you had to do the audit. If you were a large company um, or, say, like a, a, a municipality, but you didn't have to implement. And now I believe that there's some proposals on the table to um, try to force that issue. Um, and I'm not sure exactly where those stand, to be honest with you, but that yeah. it's, 
a very hot topic um, and a real, yeah, a real, a real, real topic here for sure. How, how do you think from organization's point of view, how is that going to be received? I know how I would receive it. I'm quite positive about it. I'd like that to happen. How do you think it'd be felt from the organization's point of view? Yeah, I mean, it's probably very, it's going to vary by organizations. I think you're right. There's probably a, a, a good segment that are, that are applauding, um, both from the business community, but also like, for example, the, I, I'm familiar with the real estate or association that, of, of large property owners in Sweden and across Scandinavia. I believe that they're pretty favorable to proposals around, you know, putting some teeth behind the regulations. Um, and then that gets, you know, the devil's in the details. Where, how far do you take it? Um, and where do you draw the line in terms of what, what measures you want to implement? Um, and, you know, then there's this sort of another side of it. How much, how much risk and cost do you want to put on the companies themselves um, to, push the implementation of this, um, uh, how much support and sort of policy mechanisms and, and financing schemes and sort of guarantees and other things could they use to, to really accelerate their work um, and to make it much better for their financial health as well. And I think that that's kind of a spinoff conversation that's happening yeah. um, as well. And that's really, you know, uh, pushing all about politicians. Yeah, because it is all about from the organization's point of view is the way I see it is spend to save. That's what you're doing. You're you're yeah. going to spend the money to make a saving to get a return on your investment. And as long as us as an energy expert puts the cost savings payback in front of them, we should have good indication of whether that is going to give them a good spend to save and the right return on investment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were. And I mentioned some of the um, just generally some of the innovation projects, but one of the projects that we focused on is called uh, multiple benefits of energy efficiency. Um, I can give you the links to the website where where the audience can take a look at some of the, you know, some of the approaches and some of the case studies and so on. Um, but that was really from um, trying to trying to help companies r rather than the stick approach. It was more looking at the carrot side. How, how do you help, uh, especially energy managers who are, you know, in, in there, in the companies, they understand, they may have they've done energy audits or they've had external auditors come in. They understand where the opportunities are to save. They see them, uh, they, they want to implement them, and then they get stuck uh, because the investments aren't as attractive as competing investments. Yeah. So the idea was, and I'm sure this is, <laughs> Maybe not. Not uh, is this familiar to you? Uh, it's happened to to many of your audience. So, so the idea was: well, how do we empower um, the folks that are really in the know on the energy side to bring a compelling business case to the the decision making, the investment decision makers? Um, and the idea is that uh, kind of builds from from looking at the behavior of investment decision in companies where. With, with, and the insight I think I'd like to just convey is that, that these decision makers have various <laughs> reasons why they want to invest in things, but generally it boils down to, is this investment going to be competitive for the company? Is it going to contribute to our competitive advantage in the marketplace? Um, and right there, you have to be able to figure out, okay, how as an energy manager do I maybe connect um, a lighting project or a motors and drives project or a compressed air optimization or a change at electrification of some component in my system. How do I connect what I'd like to implement and get money for to that, to that uh, proposition, uh, competitive proposition of the company? And that's really what the project was all about, was trying to look at uh, how do we craft the process to do that and then empower energy managers with some tools and uh, analysis tools, communication tools to make that compelling. Um, and I, I, I can go into that more, but yeah, that, that was really the carrot side. Was the, um, uh, can you give some examples of the, the multiple benefits? Yeah, absolutely. So 
there's three sort of buckets of benefits that um, that were developed, and this this comes out of uh, sort of the business literature around what is what is competitive competitiveness for companies. So there's really the the value proposition bucket is is one uh, area, and you know that is really like what value is this company delivering to its customers. Um, so it could be, you know, the, the classic might be sort of, if you look at cars and you know, all those delivering safety, you know, that's their sort of primary value proposition, safe, high quality vehicles. Um, but like from a company perspective, it might also be, well, we, we are, um, you know, we have the cheapest product or we have the, you know, the longest lasting product, whatever it is, those are those are sort of the, the value proposition bucket of benefits. And normally in like these energy cases that I could talk about more specifically, but normally it's how to how do the energy projects contribute to the, the turnover, greater turnover for this company in the end. Um, that's that's their and, and the value that they're delivering to their customers based on the value they're delivering to their customers. And then there's the cost side, and you, you talked about that as well. So it's, I mean, energy cost is clearly one cost category, and um, but it's usually not the highest cost. So there might be, um, I think, you know, there's maintenance, there's um, operational costs associated with it, there's um, insurance costs, there's other kinds of costs that are related to energy that could be could be looked at. Um, and then there's a third category, which is risks. And the risks area could be things like, um, you know, are you, uh, what's, is this something that relates to injuries or um, does it relate to the risk of, uh, you know, climate risk or other types of risks? So those are sort of three buckets of, of benefits. Um, that we, yeah, we try to bake into the, uh, to the project, into the analysis. And off the back of those three areas, you build policy regarding how you're going to deliver that, yeah? So I think, yeah, this, this has some policy dimensions for sure. And we've been, um, I think a next, the next phase, the, the project that I mentioned, this was EU funded, um, ended just earlier, just last year, late last year. Um, I think the next phase of it could be that, yeah, absolutely. When, when say policies are implemented that, that want to raise, let's say they want to create a higher ambition level for, for energy efficiency or, or for increased energy management in companies, our, our argument is that, well, they should certainly look at all the benefits associated with, um, you know, with the uh, projects or with the policy, not just the energy savings alone, uh, because that's a quite a myop myopic perspective. Um, so I think that that's getting some traction, at least in the European policy circles on how to, how to include multiple benefits. Um, at the company level, though, you know, our, our um, work was really, we, we tested out this method and these tools with about 20 companies across Europe. They were, they were a real mix of companies and some industrial companies, um, some that were more like property management companies, et cetera. Um, different countries, uh, we had partners in Italy, we had partners in Germany and in, in uh, Portugal and Poland and, and the Scandinavia. We had a British partner, but they, you know, there wasn't a lot of implementation in the UK, unfortunately, but Oxford was, Oxford was with us as one of our academic partners. Um, and all of these projects showed that there are always opportunities to quantify additional benefits in an investment proposal outside of energy cost savings. So that was the good news. And what we learned as well was that not, not all of the benefits all the time are, are quantifiable, but it's often still good to identify those as benefits in the proposal uh, for the company, because um, you know it, it illuminates that these these are there, um, and normally you can quantify some of them. And in that case, it makes the financial not the financial analysis more com compelling, but it also 
sort of it helps the energy manager draw a line and a link back to the competitiveness piece that I mentioned before. So, you know, an example, and maybe some of your listeners um, who listen to Elvira Rakova and, and Directin um, in your, one of your previous podcasts, they might have heard this, but we did, we did a case study with um, Direct and they do uh, compressed air optimization. Uh, and they worked with an Italian manufacturer on an optimization project. Um, and they saw a, um, an absolute tremendous takeaway. I mean, number one, uh, the company in this case had sort of noise levels uh, that were in excess of the local noise ordinances. So this is a small company. They're in an Italian village and they're, you know, the villagers want to kick the company out because they're such I heard a, the story, actually. a noisy neighbor, right? And then, <laughs> so through the project, they were able to, to, to address that compressor noise and, and reduce that to the safe noise threshold. And they changed the timings of it. So it wasn't in the height of the day or something or in the evenings. I yeah, they that changed quite a lot of things, didn't they? Yeah, they did. They did. I mean, it, it was one of those domino effects. They started to look at... Um, you know, the, the indoor air and the machines, and then they, it's really spiraled. So, so it created this whole benefit around noise and sort of regulatory compliance, um, which was huge, had, had not much to do with energy, but was a yeah. big deal for them. Um, and the other thing that, that they, they cited, the company managers were citing was that um, they, they had a lot of, um, um, they had, I guess, a lot of injury risk associated with how their their lines and distribution systems were set up and and by you know addressing the uh, the compressed air system and, and really sort of creating a, a, a different um, a different design they were able to really improve the conditions for their staff so they wouldn't have to um, have the same level of injury risks so that was another big deal there and and when we did the math, you know, we couldn't quantify all these benefits, but I'll just give you sort of one, one figure on the financial side, which was that the payback wasn't a big payback, but I think the simple payback period with just the energy savings was about two years. Um, and they cut off about six months of that by including some of the maintenance related benefits. Um, so, you know, and that's, that's one example. There, there was another example um, that I can give. I mean, there's other examples I can give too, but maybe I'll I'll pause there. Is it <clears throat> what you're discussing? Do we go down to um, do we go down to the technical level? So LED lights, building management systems. Does it go down deeper into what we're discussing? Yeah, I think the the general approach is is applicable to all the measures she mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's intended to look at base, basically it's intended to kind of start with the energy audit. So the energy audit's done. And then you look at what measures were outlined there and it's intended to kind of give this, um, put, put this competitiveness lens on those different measures and say, okay, if we look at all the benefits of these measures, which ones flow to the top, which ones really look the most compelling, yeah. um, yeah, and there's different but benefits, on, as you say, on depending paper, on... On paper, they may not look... They still look like a, a payback. But when you start... You know, if you take LEDs, for instance, I know some organisations only like to see what the, the benefit's going to be regarding the energy saving. But then we've got the uh, impact on the maintenance because there's less maintenance required because we're going to be changing that lamp less times because it's more reliable. It's going to last longer. And then there's the air conditioning savings where we're likely not to use so much heat because of the, the lights aren't going to be generating so much heat. When I do my, um, especially within ESOS, we don't look at that. We just do simple paybacks. Yeah. Um, and then when you look at the, the life cycle cost analysis, when, when you bring in the maintenance and you're bringing all these other issues, that takes some time to do that. Um, and is that what what you're doing here? That, is that like the, the putting it under the microscope? Is that what you're actually adding value to at that time? Yeah, I think that's the idea, right? Is as you say, um, 
especially the consultants, the auditors, um, people that need to put in the time. How do we make that as painless as possible? And actually, how do we give folks like you and, and the energy managers, whether they're, they're internal or, or external um, consultants, how, how do we make that a, a better business proposition for you all too, so that you're, because I think, I think it's in the best interests of, of most of the value chain there to really get the projects okay. implemented because no, nobody wants to see um, an energy audit just sitting on and gathering dust. That's what my 11 week energy program is about implementation. That's so key. Um, I, I come from the other end from, you know, I give all the over, overview elements of it. You know, it's going to cost you this, it's going to save you that, it's going to give you that payback. I do a very broad stroke review on that. And then the organization can then say yes or no at that time. For me, if, they say, if it's a yes, then we need to do the digging and really understand what the cost is, what the saving is and the payback. But you wouldn't want to do that from day one, would you? If yeah. they didn't have the appetite. You, you, it's a two-way street, Absolutely. isn't it? It's a two-way street. Yeah, really, the organization really will be... We, yeah, sorry. To, I was just think. I'm rapidly agreeing with you. I, I think you're right. You, you, uh, on the one hand, you need a kind of a low, a low risk, low, low threshold way to to just to give some comment, really some rules of thumb. Okay, this is usually what it's saving. Yeah. Um, one of the things we saw was that yeah, the process can't be arduous. Um, you got to keep it simple and and nimble. On the other hand. Um, one of the benefits that we saw with these companies and one of the, some of the feedback we got from these pilot companies was uh, that one, that they, they, the energy managers really benefited because in a way it forces them to work with all of their counterparts, like the operations staff, the maintenance team, because what you want to do is to be, if you, if you say you identify, well, what, Okay, what what is the what is the maybe, maybe there's a maintenance or operational potential benefit to um, to this say compressed air? Um, I want to be able to quantify that. It, it 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 kind of forces them to go out and talk to their counterparts on these other teams, um, and may, maybe they want to say they want to quantify even like a I mean how much for example like um, there was a project where where they improved the indoor air quality. Um, by making a change to the heating system. This is a different company example. And, and they wanted to say, well, um, what does that mean in terms of uh, net, now these employees don't have to inhale all these bad fumes? You know, what does that mean in terms of potential uh, sick time reduction? And they were actually able to talk to the human resources department and, and figure out what that cost them on average and put that into the calculation. We think we'll reduce sick leave and, and improve our indoor air quality by X amount. And that's going to have this cost savings. So that, that was um, one, as you, you know, there's the time you want to make that time efficient for everyone, but at the same time, they, what they did through that was they built, um, you know, support through the organization for ultimately that, uh, that investment proposal. And then when the time came, they had that support from some of the other key stakeholders. And, and was it an eye opener to, to see that they would have less sickness? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it's I something they it's, probably didn't think about, did they? They didn't yeah, think no, about that. Abso yeah, no, absolutely. Certainly not the energy manager, yeah. for sure. Yeah. No, so this is a learning, uh, learning um, tool as well for the companies yeah. and sort of a team building tool. Yeah, it's quite shocking, really, when you start looking at things that way. Um, yeah, I, I've got some stories that have led down that route and then you wouldn't have thought it would have, would have impacted on the organization in that way. Yeah. You know, you, you mentioned time too, and that, that was, there was another good, good example. This actually is not an energy efficiency project, but it was a solar thermal project. This is in Poland, um, a furniture, furniture manufacturer, they do custom furniture. Um, and in that case, they were, they had an old coal, boiler to do the space, the, the, the water heating, uh, some of the space heating for the factory. Turned out the owner was the one who had to go down and uh, refill the coal boiler. And he would spend 
hours every winter, especially running down to the boiler room, dealing with this coal, right? And certainly it didn't help his, you know, his, his time management. Um, and so the, um, when they looked at the alternatives, they, they looked at the solar thermal system to replace uh, at least part of the domestic hot water and space heating. Uh, they, fig they found out that, that it, was, it was totally uneconomical. I mean, it would have been, uh, you know, 20 year payback for the project. But when they included the time savings, for the boss, uh, that was that reduced the project to like under five years. So it was a huge, just a huge bet. And he just said, "Yeah, let's do it because I'm going to save so much time." He didn't even think about the energy necessarily. So um, yeah, that was that was cool. I had a site where um, the heating was on a hundred percent, twenty four seven, and we looked at the the BMS and said, look, why you got your heating on 24 seven? Let's change it. So it goes off. And then all of a sudden they keep getting these puddles everywhere in the plant rooms and they couldn't work it out because the puddles would appear. And then after about an hour, they disappear and they dry up again. And what it was when the heating system was going off, all the joints in the pipe was contracting and cracking and letting the water out. Then when we heated up again, they all closed up again. So basically mm -hmm. we found that they, that we had to get all these cracks repaired, which is, it was silly money. But the reason why the system was running 24 seven, which was decided many years ago, was because of these pipe was cracking. And it was 200 pounds worth of uh, mechanical change that we had to do. Mm -hmm. And that's the only reason why, because you've had new people who were on, on board to say, oh, I don't know why the heating's on 24 seven. Let's, let's put it back to as it should be. But it's yeah. funny how we then identified a problem to why that was. And then we managed to track back to see when that heating and that heating had been for the last three years on, on, on 24 seven, the yeah. amount of money that the business had lost through that. Yeah. All because they hadn't invested in that maintenance to fix that problem yeah yeah absolutely so sometimes it works in reverse <laughs> but it then highlights other problems you know yeah yeah absolutely i i that, that rings a lot of bells and and I, you know starting with kind of what what are the comfort issues that the companies are facing what are some of the other issues that they're facing and then almost reverse engineering it and thinking about what are the energy implications can we get some savings there it's maybe the way to go yeah <laughs> so well, well, Jason, it's come to this time. It's gone really quick. I can't believe how quickly the uh, our time's gone, but it's come to this time where I like to put you on the spot. And this is your first podcast. So well done for your first podcast. Thanks and I'll put you on totally on the spot completely throughout this. But um, is there anything that you can give back to the industry today as a takeaway from your experience? Yeah, thanks for the question, Paul. And, and again, for the opportunity to be on my first podcast. Um, it's been a lot of fun. So I would say, you know, my, my motto this year, 2022 is action. Um, I think that a lot of the, I would imagine a lot of the energy managers, folks listening, um, want to maybe step up and um, maybe it's the climate uh, crisis that we're in, or maybe it's just that, uh, you know, they're tired of seeing their, their good work not being maybe implemented as much as they like to, but we, we have, um, on the, on the website mbenefits.eu, there's uh, a lot of good tools, case studies that I was talking about today um, to, to reach out to us um, and, and start to see if some of those could make some sense for them to, to test out. Um, I think that there's uh, always room for improvement. I think, as you say, the processes need to be nimble and easy for folks to be able to, to try out some of this. Um, but we've got some good foundations in place um, for the energy managers around the world to, to take a look at, uh, to see if maybe this could help them in their day-to-day -day, um, and inspire some more investment in their companies and, and help them be more successful. So I'd say, you know, check out the website um, and please reach out to me. I'm happy to provide my details, if folks have any follow-up questions about this, or maybe they what, want to get what's engaged. What's the website? Some way. Yeah, it's M 
as in uh, multiple benefits. That's one word. Dot eu. Right. And on there is a um, is a library. It's got sort of what the general process was during the project, and then a library of of case studies, etc. But um, encourage folks to take a look. And and really we. We uh, hope that there'll be some follow-on funding for this as well, um, that we can work with even more, another cohort of companies going forward. Yeah. So that's my, real, that's my real hope. But in the meantime, we're really very available for, uh, you know, for, for questions and follow-up. Right. Well, Jason, we hope you join us on Omlink and, and become part of the, the forums on there and the, the expert areas to, to give that knowledge back and and obviously give access to that that website as well. We, we want to see that and, and hear about that because it does help the industry. You know, the idea of Omnic is taking away all that confusion and, and that's what you're doing today. And I really appreciate you taking the time and, and joining us today on our, our podcast. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, thanks again, Paul. You're doing good work with this network and uh, keep it up. Thank you. And Jason, you and your family, please stay safe in these times. Thanks. You, the same to you. Thank you. All right.